total clickbait. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and that title is absolutely clickbait. No, not really. But it is more about me entertaining myself, trying to figure out how to go beyond a development announcement to make a modestly larger point about photography and gear reviews on YouTube in general, because you know better. Of course, a camera announcement cannot be, by any reasonable stretch of the imagination, truly dangerous. When it comes to photography, dangerous is being embedded with the troops landing on Omaha Beach for the Allied invasion of Europe in 1944, like Robert Kappa, making the mistake of photographing the wrong couple in an embrace, or to be more precise, getting caught doing so, as we learned in a story this past week. You already knew that. You already knew I was using creative license. As in... The just-announced X-Pro3 might result in a cashectomy to your credit line, possibly mine. There's the danger to you or me. Or the X-Pro3, while a modest update to the already legendary X-Pro2, just might impact competitors' bottom lines because Fujifilm has thought deeply about and doubled down on the process and joy of taking a photograph. It may lead more people than ever to rethink what is important in one's camera decision-making process. Maybe making a different choice. Is it the theoretical breadth and depth of what a camera system can do? Or is it how well a camera system encourages and enables you in real life, instrument in hand, to be the best, most creative version of yourself? Are these mutually exclusive? There's the danger to the competition. You probably know the X-Pro3 basics by now, too. Body made from titanium, Dura coatings, the mixed reaction to the rear panel, improved hybrid viewfinder, new film simulation and tone controls, and the likelihood that the X-Pro3 will use the exact same sensor and processor as in the X-T3 and X-T30 with attendant gains in autofocus performance. The question is, as is so often the case these days, so what? For most people, candidly, I suspect it's just another announcement and what I think many will agree has become a fatiguing, constant stream of new, 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 new. For others, the X-Pro3 announcement may be more interesting than most because the X-Pro series was already semi-legendary for its innovation and one some might call its beloved quirkiness, excellent lens system, and significant fan base. And in any case, the really revolutionary stuff is either old news like the rise of mirrorless hybrid cameras or with the exception of the latest computational advances in mobile photography, out another year or three, like a global shutter. Still, for those of us who love the practice of photography, those of us who want a photographic instrument, not a hybrid, those of us who understand and value the process and have known the joy of shooting, the X-Pro3 announcement is a reaffirmation of Fujifilm's profound respect, I think, for the photographer and the photographer's mindset. And just might be the thing that ignites your creative passion to a whole new level. It is a pinpoint offering between the, call it, twice the price, APS-C like a CL, which I own, love, and use for my personal work, and the iconic rear panel less, stripped to the barest of essentials, call it five times the price, full frame, manual focus only, true rangefinder like a M10D, a camera after which I lust. Though it was the Fujifilm X-T2 back in 2017 which first rekindled my joy in photography. It is a testament to the X-Pro3 that these are the cameras that first came to mind as I watched the recent X-Summit. The irony for now, until we learn more of the details, is that the rear touch panel of the X-Pro3 is, for me, and like the M10D, the most positively interesting thing about it. Where the Leica CL has a fixed rear touch panel, which I like very much, and the M10D, no rear panel at all. Quite a statement of intent, which I applaud, by the way, though it is not to everyone's taste, I freely admit. Fujifilm has implemented a touch panel that you cannot access other than by actively flipping it down. They call it hidden, I guess, because they don't want you to use it as often as most photographers do theirs. Fujifilm is serving a different target market. 
Actually, for those of you who already own an X-Pro1 or 2 or are interested in the 3, what kind of photographer would you call yourself? Enthusiast, professional, amateur, semi-pro, hobbyist? Maybe something else? The back of that panel, the one you see whenever the back is closed up, which is most of the time, sports a smaller sub-panel with basic exposure data that reminds me, actually, of the top plate on the X-H1. And, as others have already mentioned, is reminiscent of the film carton holder found on many analog cameras back in the day. Kudos to Fujifilm for embracing their inner whimsy and including an electronic version of that analog film box for each of its brilliant film simulations displayable on that sub-panel in color. I appreciate both aspects of the X-Pro3 rear panel. For street photography, I sometimes like to be able to look down at my framing rather than through a viewfinder. I sometimes do want to quickly check exposure or focus after the shot. And I do like being reminded of my youth and the joys of discovery. Yet, I also like the idea of not being tempted to chimp, remaining focused on seeing and capturing the moment. The X-Pro3's rear panel is a clever response to these competing instincts. As for the rest of it, we will see soon enough. I'll be at Photo Plus Expo with Claudia on the 24th. Uh, Fujifilm will have a fuller announcement the day before on the 23rd. And like many of you, I plan on stopping by their exhibition. If you see us there, please come over and say hi. For now, though, the following questions are uppermost in my mind. One, and in the end, the most important of all for me personally, what has changed inside the EVF beyond what was announced? When I evaluated the Expro 2, and I'll put a link to that review in the show notes below, I was impressed by the innovation of the hybrid optoelectronic finder, but I wished for a significantly larger and more legible EVF. Especially since the Expro series isn't actually a rangefinder at all, relying instead on an EVF patch in one corner of the optical finder, manual zone focus, or full-blown EVF. The Expro 2's EVF offers what I'll call de rigueur 2.4 million dots of resolution, but to my eye, it isn't particularly bright or crispy, and at just 0.59x magnification and 16mm eye relief, its modest spec is a material issue for me. Your mileage may vary. Fujifilm has said that the new EVF has higher resolution, contrast, and frame rate, wider color space, and is brighter. Does this mean the 3 takes the 0.75x 23mm eye relief 3.7 million dot OLED unit of the X-T3? Will it have the microprism simulation of the X-T3? I quite like that. They said this is a new panel, but even if it were the one from the X-T3, I'd be happy. If it had, say, the magnification of the original like M3 0.92x, that would be industry-leading, and that might be enough for me to invest. Two, how bright is that rear panel when flipped down, when you're actually trying to use it? Will it be better than most when using it as a waist-level finder in bright sunlight? Will it dim to conserve power or dissipate heat? Hold that thought, though, what it clearly won't do is offer any help when shooting with the camera overhead as in a crowd. I lament that fact. 3. Does the X-Pro3 offer a higher capacity battery or lower power drain through more efficient electronics? Either way, this would be a welcome change. The battery is relatively small. 4. Does the titanium make the camera substantially lighter, heavier, or neither? During their X-Summit, Fujifilm talked about the titanium in the context of durability. Titanium is actually heavier by mass than aluminum or magnesium, but much stronger. How will these differences be used beyond durability? Will the camera feel better in hand? Will it feel more robust? Will the titanium allow Fujifilm to do things it has thus far been unable to do in its crop sensor cameras, save the X-H1 like 5 Ibis? Could titanium be used to create the space inside the camera body necessary for just this purpose? Much as I'd like to think so, it's highly unlikely. Like the GFX100, They'd certainly have made a big point of it if they could. But even if there's no IBIS in this X-Pro3, it's interesting to ask where and when will titanium be used in other X cameras and to what end? X-T4? X-H2? Do these two lines merge? THX 1138? 6. Does the use of titanium imply that there will be no video whatsoever? The folks at the X Summit stressed pure photography anyway, and they acknowledge that titanium is substantially worse for heat dissipation. 4K recording will heat things up very quickly, as actually will extended high-speed bursts and the use of a Bluetooth app. 7. How much will it cost? The launch price of the X-Pro2 back in early 2016 was 1700 bucks, but that camera is now selling at 1500 as is the X-T3. 
The X-H1 with grip at the time I'm recording this, September 2019, is just a thousand bucks. Like every other manufacturer out there, Fujifilm is facing margin pressure as sales volumes continue to drop. Can they bring the X-Pro3 out at anything more than $1,700 to address that pressure? Would consumers accept such a price? Can they bring it to market for anything less and still make money? Would their finance team accept such a price? The finance guys did accept this kind of approach with the X-T3. It is fascinating to recall that Fujifilm launched the X-T3 priced below the X-T2. They dropped the X-T2 price shortly thereafter. But now the X-T2 is selling again for $100 more than the X-T3, $1,600. It's still a great camera. Finally, a corollary to seven as we wrap this up. Eight. If Fujifilm does drop the price of the X-Pro2 as it did with the X-T2 when the X-T3 launched, Will this result in a sudden rush to X-Pro2 sales at the expense of X-Pro3 sales? Will it be temporary just to get eyeballs on the Fujifilm brand and clear some inventory? If Fujifilm does not lower the price of the X-Pro2 and does offer the X-Pro3 for, say, $1,800, might that be a danger to Fujifilm? Or is it the nature of such a unique camera that demand will be price inelastic? All will be revealed shortly. This episode is made possible by patrons like Ben Friedlin. Visit www.patreon.com slash Hugh Brownstone to learn more. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below. You guys continue to be just incredible, knowledgeable, inspiring, funny. I mean, you're a joy, truly. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Grab one or both of our new Hold That Thought t-shirts you wanted us to put up at our new 3bmepthreadless.com store. Support our work by using our affiliate links down below in the show notes, dropping us coffee money via our PayPal link down below in the show notes, or even better than that, we invite you to become a patron of our work over at Patreon. Link down below. We've created our Patreon page because we are stoked to bring you not only gear reviews, but with our What Were You Thinking and Good World Gone Bad series, historical, educational, artistic morsels, and longer form conversations, not interviews, with world-class photographers, curators, gallery owners, keepers of the legacy, folks like Elliot Erwitt, Anya Sear, Mark Lubell, Ethelene Staley, and friends like Brian Smith, Paul Giroux, Nino Rakicevich, and more. We'd really like you to join us to deliver this kind of content regularly. Your support on Patreon will really help us ramp it up. In which case, as always, we thank you for it. That's it. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time.